So our very basic discussion of the CMOS inverter in video one was useful in finding the values of V output high and V output low. And it proved that three of the problems we had with ratioed logic families are solved by the CMOS inverter. But there's one question we have not yet answered, which is the question of noise margins. And to discover the noise margins of uh, the CMOS inverter, we first have to draw its VTC. So there is a systematic way to draw the VTC of any uh, inverter. Uh, first, we draw the x and y axes. And so the VTC is a relationship between the x-axis, the input, and the y-axis, the output. And then we want also to track the regions of operation of the two transistors in the gate as we sweep the input from 0, zero volt to VDD, which is the range of, of, uh, of voltages that we have available. And so we are going to sweep all the way up to VDD, up from 0 volt. And just keep the, uh, keep the schematic of the inverter handy on the side because we're going to need it. Uh, it's, it's important to recall that for the NMOS, V output is VDS. For the PMOS, uh, VDS is V output minus VDD. For the NMOS, VGS is V input. And uh, for the NMOS, uh, VGS is V input minus VDD. Now, there are two points on the VTC that we already know. The input, uh, the point V input, uh, V output low and V output high, and the point V output high and V output low. So when the input is V output low, which is zero volt, the, the output is VDD. So we know that this point zero and VDD is on the VTC. This is a point we obtained from the static analysis of the inverter. We also know that when the input is VDD, the output is zero volts. So we know that that other point on the very other extreme is also on the VTC, which is good. This is something we wanted to see. Now, we also know that when the output is VDD, uh, the NMOS is cut off and the PMOS is omic. To understand why, review video one. We also know that when the output is zero volt and the input is VDD, the NMOS is ohmic and the PMOS is off. Again, this, this comes from the uh, static solution of the inverter. And so the question then is, how does the region of operation uh, change as we sweep for both transistors? And the easiest thing to think of is, when does the NMOS turn on? It is cut off, but when does it turn on? Because V input is VGS for the NMOS, then it turns on when V input is equal to V threshold N. So all the way up to V threshold and the NMOS is going to be cut off. And as long as the NMOS is cut off, then we have the same situation that we had for when the input was zero volt, with zero current flowing, the PMOS being on, and there's zero drop on the PMOS. And thus the output is going to be VDD all the way up to V threshold N. And so there's a horizontal section of the VTC that looks something like this. Similarly, um, backing off from VDD, we know that the PMOS transistor starts at uh, cutoff, but when does it turn on? The PMOS will turn on when its gate, V input, falls below its source, VDD, by enough voltage that we have a V threshold P difference. And therefore, it will continue to be cut off all the way down to VDD minus V threshold P. But be careful to use absolute value of V threshold P, because V threshold P is a negative number. And so, the PMOS is going to be cut off up until this point, or down until this point, VDD minus V threshold P. Now, the question is, when the NMOS uh, turns on, when MN turns on at V threshold N, does it turn on in saturation or does it turn on in the ohmic regime? We know that the NMOS will eventually end up being ohmic at V input equals VDD, but the question is, does it turn, does it go from cutoff to saturation to ohmic, or does it go from cutoff to ohmic uh, in one step? And the answer is obviously that it will go from cutoff to saturation and then to ohmic. We did this for all ratioed logic families, and let's do it again. The VTC is continuous, and so we know that the VTC will start at this point, V threshold N and VDD, and it's going to drop from this point. But it's going to start at this point and it's going to be continuous. And so as, that tra as the NMOS transistor turns on, it sees a very high drain voltage because V out starts out at VDD. And it also observes this high drain voltage when its gate voltage, V input, is rather small. And therefore, it's definitely going to be saturated uh, in this uh, regime. So it's going to turn on in saturation first. 
So when does it switch from saturation to ohmic? If we look at the NMOS, VDS is the output, and it's saturated when VDS is greater than VGS, and for the NMOS, VGS is V input, minus V threshold N. So V output equals V input minus V threshold N is the equation corresponding to uh, this inequality. This is an equation of a straight line whose slope is equal to unity and which has an x-intercept of plus v threshold n. And so, so we draw a straight line with a unity slope and an x-intercept at v threshold n. Any point above this in the plane is going to be saturated, the NMOS is going to be saturated, and any point below this in the plane, the NMOS is going to be ohmic. Now let's think of a similar analysis for the PMOS, right? So the PMOS is uh, going to turn on when the uh, input falls below VDD minus absolute value V threshold P. And at this point, the VTC is going to rise up, so, uh, but it's going to be continuous, so it's going to start at a very low potential. This means that the PMOS is also going to start up in saturation because if V output, which is the drain of the PMOS, starts at ground, which is the lowest potential, then VDS for, uh, the M for the PMOS is going to be minus VDD when we start out, which is a huge, uh, hugely negative VDS. And it's enough to cause the PMOS to saturate. Now, it's important to, st you know, to recall that the NMOS and the PMOS are kind of similar, even though they are the opposite of each other, because they both saturate when they see a potential that is absolutely large across the channel. For the NMOS, the drain is higher than the, the source, and so when we see a large positive value for VDS, it's going to saturate. For the PMOS, the source is greater than the drain, and thus um, we see a large negative value for VDS, then it's going to saturate, right? So it's just the same thing, basically. And so the, the, the PMOS is going to start out in saturation, and then it's going to switch to ohmic. But when does it switch to ohmic? The inequality for, for uh, saturation for the PMOS is VDS, and VDS for PMOS is V output minus VDD is less than, because we do uh, the opposite inequality um, to the NMOS, it's less than VGS, which for the PMOS is V input minus VDD, minus V threshold P. And because V threshold P is a, is a negative number, let's change that into plus absolute value V threshold P. This inequality is equivalent to the equation V output is equal to V input plus V threshold P. Now, again, this is a straight line with a unity slope, but the x-intercept is going to be a negative number. And so we need to go to the negative x-axis and see where minus absolute value v threshold p is going to be. And that's where we start to draw the straight line with a unity slope. And the difference between the NMOS and the PMOS is that the points below this line, the PMOS is going to be set, and the points above it the PMOS is going to be ohmic. And so basically what's happening is that the VTC is going to go down like this. And when the uh, VTC intersects the straight line for the PMOS, the PMOS is going to switch from ohmic to set. And when it intersects the straight line for the NMOS, the NMOS is going to switch from uh, set to ohmic. Now, notice something really interesting about the VTC, which is that it has symmetry. Going from left to right and going from right to left, the NMOS and the PMOS pretty much do the same thing, meaning that going from left to right as VGS rises, the NMOS turns on in saturation and then becomes ohmic. The PMOS does the same thing if we start at VDD and go down to uh, ground. And this is a, um, a manifestation of the fact that both transistors play the role of a driver. There's no load and there's no specific driver. Both transistors play a complementary role, which is why we call this CMOS, or complementary CMOS. Now, there is a question about the VTC and the specific shape of the VTC. Uh, this range, here in the middle, it seems to suggest that there is a range where both transistors are in saturation. Now, there's a possibility that as the NMOS uh, switches from saturation to ohmic, and the PMOS switches from uh, saturation to ohmic going back, right, 
there will be a range where both transistors are set for a, uh, a period of V input. But how do we know that the opposite doesn't happen? Like the NMOS could be set ohmic and the PMOS could be set ohmic. And now there's a range of V input where both are ohmic. So how do you know that it's the first situation, situation I, instead of situation double I? And if we look here, then these two straight lines are parallel to each other. And definitely because of the uh, monotonically decreasing nature of the VTC, we're going to intersect the line for the, for the PMOS first and then the line for the NMOS. And therefore, if anything, there has to be a range where both are saturated. It's impossible for them to both be uh, ohmic for any range. Notice that the area between these two lines, this area, is going to be an area where both transistors are saturated. And this is a very critical area. So, you know, we say when they both are saturated, uh, that's an important area to us. And um, like this range of the input, we want to find out how wide this range is, how uh, big it is. And so what we do is we, wrote, we write down the KCL equation, the only equation we have, IN is equal to IP, and just use the saturation regime in each case. So we use SAT for both. And now the NMOS is going to be KN over 2 into VGS, which is uh, V input minus V threshold N squared, is equal to the saturation current of PMOS, KP over 2. And VGS is going to be V input minus VDD minus V threshold P all square. Now, this equation is really interesting because if you look at it, it is not a quadratic equation. It is the equation of two straight lines, right? Because there's a perfect square on, on both sides of the equation. This is similar to what we did for the enhancement load inverter when we found that we had a straight line uh, as soon as the NMOS as the driver turned on. But this is actually more interesting because it isn't actually a, uh, an equation of a straight line. This is an equation in only a single unknown. So the only unknown here is V input. So there's no V output does not make an appearance. This is an equation only in V input. And so we can solve and find a value for V input. V input equals X, which is going to be a value in terms of KP and KN and VDD and V threshold P and V threshold N. And we will find an expression for this value, X. But what we found here is that the two transistors are not going to be saturated for a range of V input. The two transistors are going to be saturated for a single value of the input. And so this is wrong and this is wrong. What's going to happen, in fact, is that the two transistors are going to switch from saturation to ohmic at the same point. right? And so there's only a single value of V input where the two transistors are going to be saturated. And so what's going to happen really is that as the NMOS turns on in saturation and then turns to ohmic and the PMOS um, switches from off to set to ohmic, there's going to be a range in the middle where both are set. But this is not a range. This is a specific value of V input. V input equals X. And so where they both are saturated, it's going to be a ver vertical line. V input equals X is the equation of a vertical line. And this tells us that the transition region for the CMOS inverter is going to be extremely sharp because we have only a single point where both transistors are saturated, not a range of, of, of input voltages. And so this finally tells us that at least qualitatively, we can say that the noise margins of the CMOS inverter are going to be much better than the, the, the noise margins of Fraser logic families. This is a really sharp transition region, come to think of it. Now, if, if you go back and look, uh, why did we have only a single value for V input? Uh, that caused them to be saturated because when we wrote the equations for the saturation current in both transistors, they were only a function of V input. If you look at the schematic of the CMOS inverter, um, V input is part of VGS for both transistors. V output is part of VDS for both transistors. And so the only way that we would have seen V output make an appearance in this equation, which is the equation of saturation current, is if the drain potential uh, makes an appearance in the saturation current equation. How would drain potential contribute to saturation current? The only secondary effect we know that does this is 
the uh, channel length modulation effect. And so if we had here 1 plus lambda p into uh, v output minus vdd, and we had on the other side uh, 1 plus lambda n v output, then in this case the equation does not become an equation in single unknown v input, but becomes an equation in two unknowns v output and v input. And thus it would describe uh, a curve that would cause this range to become wider, the range where both are saturated, to become wider. Uh, and so the effect that would cause us to uh, deviate from this ideal behavior of the CMOS inverter is the channel length modulation effect.